Football is back. The NFL's new kickoffs. Did they work for you? Justin Herbert oh, yeah. in a walking boot already. And speaking of things not working out, updates on Mike Trout and the White Sox. We got Tim, Jen, Harry, and Pablo. When, when did you get here? Snuck in. Hi. Pablo. Pa <laughs> what? Set your alarm clock. It's Friday, people. Let's have a little fun and let's start with last night's Hall of Fame game and the kickoffs everyone was looking forward to. There were eight kickoffs before the game was called early due to the weather. The longest return made it to the 31, three made it to the 26, and there was one touchback, which now gives the receiving team the ball at the 30. All right, Jen, you watched it last night. How did it match your expectation? Did you like it? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Well, to be fair, I watched it between watching Olympic coverage as well, but I did watch it specifically for the new kickoff rule. I saw a great animation that Joe Buck did, which was fantastic, but I didn't see enough to write off this new rule completely because we all know that touchbacks are one of the most boring things to ever occur on a football field, and 73% of all kickoffs last year ended in a touchback. I would rather watch Pete Carroll chomp his gum on the sideline than watch another touchback. We also know that kick returns and punt returns are the most dangerous part, so they're eliminating the boredom and they're eliminating the danger part. This was not just change for change's sake, but the twos and the threes for the Bears and the Texans and special teams coordinators not not putting out anything interesting or, you know, quir quirky, that didn't do anything for me. I think I'll like the change. I like it in theory. I think by the end of the season, we will all come around on it. But I didn't see enough in the Hall of Fame game to make me think we're going to get a bunch of Devin Hesters out there in the future as the season goes Hopefully on. Hopefully you guys are paying attention. Jen was multitasking, and she complimented someone that works for the network. So that gets you another point. <laughs> Harry? <laughs> Yeah, I was solely focused on the Hall of Fame game because I can't focus on more than one thing at a time. So <laughs> I you like know. your honesty. Some of us aren't as talented, Jen. Uh, but I will say this. I think that this, even though it's a small sample size, this is going to have to be it for the NFL because of two reasons. One, it is taking all of the danger or most of the danger out of the typical kickoff play, which you had to do. Uh, and it got rid of basically what was a null and void play and a formality that we have had in the NFL over the last couple of years. And the other thing with this too is the only other alternative is to get rid of the kickoff entirely. And the NFL is never going to do that because there's only so much changing to the recipe that the NFL is going to want to be doing to their product because their product in the eyes of many people is perfect. So even though we didn't get to see a whole lot of it last night and it was kind of funny seeing that juxtaposed against Devin Hester being there yeah. and being inducted into the Hall of Fame for what he did on kickoffs was kind of funny. But I think for now, this is going to be good for what the NFL needs to accomplish. All right, fasten your seatbelts, everyone. Here's Pablo. What do you have? I feel like I got fed, spoon-fed, Frank, a football game with, like, uh, airplane noises like a parent feeds a child. Like, we can handle it. It's new. It's different. So you don't need to, like, hide it inside of other food. We get it. It's a dangerous game. This is going to be a little different. You don't have to put a big landing zone graphic. You don't need to hold. You don't need to pretend like it's a dynamic kickoff. We get it. We had to do it. We have no choice. And to Harry's point, actually, the game is so popular that none of us, of course, were ever going to watch it any less. And so I'm glad that we're trying something different. I'm glad that players will be healthier, net net. I'm also glad that we can sort of, um, you know, just move on to stuff that's more interesting, which, again, tends to not be the kickoff previously and probably not in the future with this right, one. Speaking of moving on to things interesting, let's go to Tim Kalisha, who remembers okay. when they used to do kickoffs straight on. Remember them, Tim? Back straight in the on from the 40-yard line with a goal post right on <laughs> the goal right. line where it's supposed to be. People <laughs> running into them when men were men. Let's play some football. Uh, no, I like it for the most part. I don't like the complete absence of the onside kick, specifically yeah, the agree. surprise onside kick. You can't do that. Would Sean Payton have a Super Bowl ring under these new rules? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But in general, yes, I agree with everybody else. Touchbacks are a terribly boring way to start an NFL game. Uh, actually, the coin toss is, too, with everybody deferring. They should get the deferral out of there. But beyond that, yeah, the – Nobody's going to show anything. They're going to have different wrinkles, you would think. They'll come up with things along the way. But, it, but it's not supposed to be touchdowns galore. It's just supposed to be a football play to start the game, and that's what we had. Right, Jen wants to get back in. Quickly, last word. 
Well, we appreciate that they are prioritizing player safety. It is supposed to cut down on collisions and concussions. What will that 18th game do that the NFL yeah. seems to really want to be adding that we will likely see over the next decade or so? Harry, you got a problem with when the way they ended the game? Should they have waited a little bit longer? There always seems to be some issue at this Hall of Fame game. I have no problem with it. The weather was obviously bad enough to where they had to stop the game at a certain point, and we are still talking about a preseason game. If it would have been a regular season game, perhaps you try to wait a little bit longer, but no, I think the first preseason game of the season, you, you cancel it. I think Pablo wants them to build a dome just for that one game. All right, on to Giants camp where the team's co-owner, John Mara, says he isn't feeling buyer's remorse on Daniel Jones's contract. Quote, last year he got hurt, and let's be honest, when he was playing, we weren't blocking anybody. So let's give him a chance with a better offensive line and some weapons around him to see what he can do. On Saquon Barkley, Mara said, that was a decision they made. No, I wasn't crazy about it. I didn't want to lose him. Meanwhile, on the hopes for this season, Mara said, I expect us to take a step forward this year. That's a lot to get into, Tim. What was your takeaway? from what John Mara said. Yeah, I'm very confused. This is an NFL owner saying the GM and the head coach are making decisions and he lets them do that and he doesn't step on their toes. <laughs> I haven't heard I haven't heard that since Clint Murkison was around here about 40 years ago. So this is this is a definitely a different approach. Actually, it's an approach 31 teams take. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think he's kidding himself on the Daniel Jones part and and I don't think they have any choice because he's there and he's not going to come out and rip him. But I think we've seen a lot of Daniel Jones. And as a quarterback, he's a pretty good runner. And that, that's what we know about Daniel Jones. And they're going to have wow. to this is a this is a hot seat year for the quarterback, the head coach, the GM, not the owner, but uh, everybody else. It's, I think it's going to be a long year for the for uh, Big Blue. Jen I actually appreciate that he is not putting his hands on the football operations. He's not a meddling owner, right? He is right. allowing the people that he has put in those positions, the GM and the coach in this position, to do the jobs that he has given them. And if they don't do them to the standard that he has set, then they will be on the outside looking in. I don't think the Daniel Jones contract, four years, $160 million, looks that bad now when you're seeing all these other guys around the league getting significantly more. It only goes up year by year. I also think you can't really judge Daniel Jones because he doesn't exist in a vacuum. That offensive line for the Giants was atrocious. Yeah. They went out and got five, I think, free agents to try to bolster the offensive line. They also gave him Malik Neighbors from LSU. They were a terrible team throwing the ball downfield, explosive plays of 20 yards or more. He was second in FBS in that category alone. All of those things, those weapons, that protection should make Daniel Jones a closer version to 2022 Daniel Jones, and then that contract will feel worth it. Harry? So we're all kind of scratching our heads like, hey, the owner's really, really letting the, willing to let his guys work. I, I don't think it's because he actually is. I think it's because he is setting the table for firing them at the end of the season if he doesn't see that improvement that he was talking about. Because I will give him this. Daniel Jones was not put in a good position last year, whether it was because he was hurt, whether it was because that offensive line was bad, or because they just really didn't have a team built around him. Uh, but he was using a whole lot of, yeah, they made this decision or they wanted to trade up into the top three to replace Daniel Jones. So I think John Mayer was very specific with his words and trying to at least, again, set the table for if this season does not go well, if they do not improve, which I don't know how you could look at their team individually or even just within their own division and say how this is going to be a better year for the New York Giants. Pablo remembers those great days when the Giants played at Yankee Stadium. What do you make of what Mara said That's about right. Daniel Jones? Yeah, this is a lot of words to describe a team that's going to be absolutely terrible this year. Wow. Like, look at all of the projections. They're going to be the worst team in the NFC East. They probably are going to fire the head coach and the GM, as Harry was alluding to. And so this is what you say when you can't say that our best-case scenario is mediocrity. And I, I agree with Jen, actually, that Malik Neighbors is a great pick, works, makes sense with Daniel Jones, who cannot get the ball down the field. All of that's fine. But the reality, Frank, of like why they even went on hard knocks in the first place <laughs> is because there's not a lot to lose this season. Yeah. You're going to be terrible. <laughs> Might as well be kind of interesting. And we got kind of interesting from the owner of the team. You know, I just got a text from Pat Hanlon, the Giants PR guy extraordinaire. He says, oh, mute Pablo. That's what I have to listen to. Oh, Pat told me. Did I yeah. get that? There we go. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's move on to L.A. where Justin Herbert has plantar fasciitis and is in a walking boot for two weeks. Not ideal. The team says he'll be ready for week one, but with a new head coach, an offensive coordinator, new receivers, new running backs, 
I got to wonder a little bit here. All right, Harry, how much concern do you have with Herbert missing time? There's definitely got to be some concern, Frank, because of the nature of the injury, it tends to linger. Oftentimes yeah. we see with this particular injury. Uh, I do think the, the bright spot in this is we are talking about a guy who I think most of us feel still has more potential, more room to be good. Out of quarterbacks in their first four seasons, he has 114 touchdown passes. He's tied with Patrick Mahomes for second, and the only quarterback in NFL history that was has been better in his first four seasons is Dan Marino. So combine that with a coach in Jim Harbaugh, who is known to get the most out of his quarterbacks, I think they'll ultimately be okay, but I really hope that they're patient with him in this. Pablo? Yeah, it's just an unbelievable number of variables that Justin Herbert's going to have to deal with when he gets onto the field. Greg Roman is now the OC. Greg Roman likes to run the ball. Of course, it's a big difference from how he had been playing. Justin Herbert had years previous. No Austin Eckler, no Keenan Allen, no Mike Williams. The entire thing is different. And so when you have that plus a noun, Frank, and plantar fasciitis, that everybody feels a chill up their spine and in their foot. And when yep. they hear it in sports, yep, it's bad. And so it's just, if there's any story where it's going to be hard to evaluate the quarterback at the center of it, it's not Daniel Jones, it is Justin Herbert for all of these reasons this season. Tim? Yeah, I mean, the players Pablo just mentioned, the presence of them, that would have reduced this issue for Justin Herbert. They're all gone. When does he develop chemistry with DJ Chark, the new receiver? This is Chark's fourth team. When is he going to figure out exactly what's going on with Greg Roman and the Chargers? I think this team, there, there's a lot of trust in Harbaugh, obviously, but this is a team that could be in for a fall for at least one year. And Jen. Yeah, remember, he missed the last four games of last season as he was dealing with an injury. You mentioned new head coach, yeah. new offensive coordinator. Roman does like to run the ball, and he has two running backs that he has familiarity with from his time with the Ravens who are there. But, guys, remember, this is on his right foot. We know that this injury lingers. Every time he takes a snap and drops back, he's going to be putting all of his weight on that Look foot. That. It's going to be – he's going to have to have pain management, pain tolerance to get through this thing. I am skeptical that he makes that week one start with this injury at this day. That's impressive. You like the quarterback whisper. I like that. Tim, when you were saying owner kind of not being hands-off, who are you referring to? Is that Woody Johnson? You know, I, just, just, just a hypothetical Mark owner Davis? in, I don't in, know you, in oh, Dallas. Maybe he'll tell us to buy or sell. Next. Yeah, that's who we'll we're save that. Not the Dallas guy. Talk the Cowboys in A1? No. But Dak Prescott. What's his name? No Cowboys. No Cowboys. No Cowboys. U.S. men's basketball back on the court tomorrow against Puerto Rico. And Steve Kerr says they want to win, and they want to win big. Point differential is the tiebreaker, and Kerr says the one seed is the goal. So that it will help with the matchups in the knockout round. So, Tim, is it worth it to go for it like that? Oh, I think so. I think this is just a continuation with Steve Kerr of what we've talked about with the lineups. And he's just trying to get his team completely focused uh, on the idea that just showing up as NBA All-Stars does not get you a gold medal. There's work to be done to beat some of these teams, and they have to take the best path in order to make that happen. Jen? Yeah, it's good coaching. It's good communication by Steve Kerr. What are we worried about? Hurting people's feelings if they happen to run up the score against these teams? There are very high expectations for Team USA. They are expected to win a gold medal. Getting that one seed obviously makes it easier. I like that he is putting all of this out there. I am a little concerned about the Drew Holiday injury as he is one of their best two-way players, but we'll see how that shakes out. All right, Harry, in the in-season tournament, Boston did this to Chicago. Chicago wasn't happy that they were running up the score. Could that potentially happen here with Puerto Rico in the U.S.? Potentially, but it's going to have to happen. And I think I'd be picky with words if I was Steve Kerr. It's, it's not the goal. It's the standard, right? I mean, like anytime Team USA in basketball, men's or women's, does not beat a team by 15, 20 or more points, then we're all like, hey, like, are they taking this seriously? Like, what is going on? And even Derek White had said, hey, like, when we're playing these NBA games, sometimes we let off the gas when we get a big lead. We can't let that happen. So it seems like they're focused because they know they tend to let up on teams. That's not going to happen this time around. All right, Pablo, how does this jive with the Olympic ideal? Coming together, sportsmanship, run the score up on Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should. Steve Kerr should just show this team the footage of Carlos Arroyo That's right. beating the U.S. however many years ago, Frank. And by the way, so Harry's right about this. These are now the rules. And I actually want to take a second to celebrate the rules. This is a soccer-style thing yeah. now, Frank. You should appreciate that. 
These games are now impactful, even if the outcome is in hand. And so I love that Steeker is actually saying we should take this seriously because it actually makes the games better. And it made the in-season tournament better too, by the way, for that reason. Let, my let that be a lesson to everyone. You also mentioned yeah. where the host events that he has covered, 2004 Olympics in Athens. I was there when better they lost to happy. Puerto Rico. All right, buy or sell two. Mike Trout officially shut down for the season. This stinks. A retorn meniscus after tearing it in May. He'll end up missing the last 133 games of the season, but he says he'll be ready for the start of next season. Quote, this is equally heartbreaking and frustrating for me as it is for you, the fans. Believe me, I will do everything I can to come back even stronger. All right, Jen, your reaction to another season cut short for Mike Trapp. Yeah, it's disappointing. I think it is the seventh season of Mike Trout's career where he has missed significant time. But he is still a three-time MVP, yeah. multiple uh, gloves. I mean, this is a guy who is going to go down as one of the best of our generation to play the game. It's disappointing, but I also think a lot of people don't get to see Mike Trout play baseball because he is out there on the West Coast. They only hear the legend of Mike Trout. And so there's a part of me that feels like while this will be a part of his legacy, it will not affect his ability to end up in Cooperstown at the end of all of this. Harry Lyles? I think he used the right words. Heartbreaking and frustrating are a part of it. We're talking about a guy who, in the early portion of his career, was the best player of his generation from his first year in 2012 till the till 2020 rather he played 89 percent of his game so not only was he the best player he was one of the most durable ones and since then he's only played in 41 percent of those games it's just tough to see a guy who was so great start falling to injuries in a portion of his career where he should be playing some of his best baseball it just feels like everybody's getting robbed here pablo yeah do we need to start like a change.org position a petition to get him out of the Los Good Angeles point. Angels of Anaheim or whatever it is they are now. It's just a waste, and I, I get it. And Jen is right. The resume is unimpeachable. All of that is true. But I'd like to see him get out of there because nothing good has happened when it comes to our ability to enjoy him. Everything about this is sad. The weird jersey he was wearing that said bees on it is sad. That statement graphically, a red signature on a black background, sad. All of this is a bummer, and it shouldn't be. All right, Tim, you often say you're going to come back stronger the next year, and sometimes you do. What about Mike Trout? Do you believe him in this case? He's probably got a better chance than I do, but, <laughs> you know, Harry's right. This should have been the prime of his career, and over the last four years, he's going to average missing 90 games in each of those four years. Yes, he's still going to be a Hall of Famer, but this was going to be one of the five greatest hitters of all time, the way he started his career. Do you think he'd be smart? to get out of Anaheim, just like Shohei did? Well, I mean, it, it, he's got the long contract, but yeah, at some point, he's got a Great. desire to play on a better Phillies, better Yankees, team. Mets. You think it would be smart for poor Pablo to leave? Sorry. Have a good vacation. Harry, you're my guy. I'll, you. I'll see you. I gotta go live. But look at this. <laughs> Jen and Tim. In Dallas, Milwaukee. It's cold in Milwaukee, yeah. she says. I don't believe her. <laughs> Jen and Tim, welcome to Showdown earlier today in Paris on the Purple Track. Shakari Richardson won her 100-meter qualification round in her much-awaited Olympic debut. Semifinals and finals are tomorrow. It's quick. Tim, what was your takeaway from Richardson's Olympic debut? Uh, Much-awaited because of what happened uh, three years ago. But, yeah, it looks like, even though that's just the first heat, uh, not going to have a lot of trouble, I don't think, winning a gold medal. Jen? This heat. Yeah, I'm thrilled for her. She took so much vitriol unnecessarily four years ago. It's great to see the redemption story. I am a little disappointed we won't get a showdown between her and Sharika Jackson of Jamaica. That was really blown up on the Netflix series Sprint. But I think that she is a gold medalist in waiting and the future face of track and field for the United yeah, States. Yeah, the track and field is excellent. We still have Sydney McLaughlin to come, Noah Lyles. Tim, give us a scouting report on Shakari Richardson. What do you have? She's from Texas. What else do you need to know? Just like uh, Simone Biles. We're all the great I wanted you to say. I wanted you to say she's fast. Uh, you, you missed your mark. She's really fast. The White Sox <laughs> back on the field tonight trying to stop the bleeding. The bleeding, in this case, 17 losses in a row. Make that 17 in a row. The all-time record, of course, is 23. And still, under the modern-day futility pace of 40 wins by the 62 Mets. Tim remembers it well. Jen, at this point, yes. and you're, that's, this is your account, 
Are you rooting for the records or wins for the White Sox? I do not want them to get this record. There are a lot of very good people who work in the White Sox organization. I covered them for several years in Chicago. Uh, Jerry Reinsdorf had said that last year was disgusting, embarrassing, the worst season he had ever seen, and all he did was follow it up with this season, 2024. He should find a new hobby. Owning a baseball team is not it for him. Tim? My second year at New Providence, New Jersey, first grade. Those Mets were special <laughs> to me 40 and 120 there's nothing special about the White Sox they just have an underachieving team that doesn't play well ever but I don't want them to break the record the Mets were special oh, look at that what I like Jen showing a lot of empathy for the little people behind the scenes like we do here at around the horn Jen <laughs> you get the point you get the face time <laughs> In the individual all-around for the Olympics, we saw Simone Biles, we saw Rebecca Andrade, and we saw Suni Lee, three women who showed incredible resilience. You know about the twisties with Simone. Andrade had three ACL surgeries, and Suni Lee is in remission from kidney disease. Just an incredible story of overcoming adversity for all three of them. That's why we watched the Olympics. It was really cool to see. Yeah, what well said. All right, that's going to do it for us. Got a bit of a break in about 20 days. You'll see us, but if you're lucky, maybe you'll see me really soon. A lot of